um, to Kathy's next Watch and Learn. I'm Helen Lastown, I'm the Associate Director at the Center. And I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker for today. Uh, Ian Kirksey has uh, come to us on a whirlwind tour. Uh, he's about to finally go back to New York at the end of it. Um, he is a remarkable guy, postmodern scholar that doesn't want to really place himself in any particular discipline. We had a conversation over lunch about, did an undergraduate in cultural anthropology, he did two masters at Oxford, one on social and economic history, the other on history and medicine, and he ended up at Santa Cruz uh, doing a PhD in history of consciousness. So, it's up to you to decide where you put him. Um, he's uh, coming to uh, talk to us um, on the heels of a publication that's about to come out uh, in March called Freedom in Entangled Worlds. West Papua and the Architecture of Global Power. There are um, some uh, handouts at the back uh, for those of you who are interested at the end of the talk. So please uh, feel free to pick them up. And that's coming out March of this year. And before I hand it over, uh, I want to make an announcement that this evening, um, Ethan's going to be speaking for the uh, People's Pacific People's Partnerships um, uh, evening event, which is happening at Al Sharinga Gallery at 7 o'clock. So if you're interested in hearing more, but also being able to meet our guest speaker, um, please feel free. It's open to the public, and everybody's welcome to join. So without further ado, over to you. So thanks, everyone, for having me. Uh, and before I get this going, I want to see if I can move the computer over to the oh. We can move the podium. Mm -hmm. Great. Does that still work for everyone? <laughs> so fishermen from Biak, this little island off the west coast, uh, or sorry, off the north coast of, of West Papua, right up about there, uh, they use ma magic to capture flying fishes. There's a flying fish over there. Uh, they, they face to Java in the west, to Fiji in the east, Australia in the south, Japan in the north, calling out to their scaly relatives. They borrow foreign phrases and invent new words, trying to startle and amuse their airborne prey. So, so they remember English, uh, Amer American cat calls, basically pickup lines from World War II soldiers something you'd never be caught say, uh, saying today in a bar in New York. Uh, hey woman, come on. They, they try to, to grab the imagination of, of these fish with this strange language. And what they're doing is inviting these fish to a wild party that's taking place on shore. And the fish zoom in, they, they flock to these canoes, and then when they get on, on shore, they realize that they've been caught in this bait and switch. Uh, they, they are indeed the honored guests at this party, but they're roasted whole and eaten. Uh, so in addition to singing these songs to flying fish, the Biak magicians also are singing these songs to flying tourists. And I found myself in 1994, when I was a high school exchange student, trapped in, in an aquarium-like airport waiting lounge where there was people pressed up against the glass looking in, and a little string band inside playing this, this uh, uh, song and dance routine dressed in grass skirts and dancing. Um, so, so my imagination at that moment, I was 17, I'd never been out of the United States. It was captured by this image of, of what I thought was going to be a Pacific ideal. So, so I worked really hard to get back. Um, uh, and then when I did come back in 1998, instead of finding this tranquil paradise, instead of finding uh, a place that might be outside of time, a place where you might encounter someone from the Stone Age, Instead of that, what I found was a genocide and a revolution. Uh, so, so years later, when I came back to study this revolution, when I came to study West Papua's independence movement, I was starting to get drawn into a struggle for freedom that I was just starting to understand. I came, myself, I came uh, to find myself starting to expect the unexpected. Feel free to, to come on in. There's a couple of seats down here in the front. Uh, feel free to sit on the floor if you like.
So when I came back as a graduate student wanting to study what I imagined to be a struggle of resistance, resistance both to this military occupation by Indonesia and to the forces of globalization, I made unexpected discoveries that forced me to rethink the very terms of my research. I found that it was collaboration rather than resistance that was the primary strategy of this political movement. And today I've got a three-part punchline to this talk. One, one is that uh, collaboration by itself can quickly lead to co-optation. Part two of this punchline is that hope by itself can produce paralysis, passively waiting for something, waiting for dreams to be fulfilled. Uh, you know, you, you, it, it's, it's just sort of resigning the future to fate. But it's, it's when these two things come together, when imagination meets collaboration, that freedom comes within reach. Uh, so Freedom in Entangled Worlds, the, the, the title of this talk, the title of my book, can be found by maneuvering for rights and justice within a nested matrix of power, rather than trying to establish an illusion of complete sovereignty. So I'm going to start about talking uh, about collaboration, um, using uh, the story of Esther Nawitba uh, as, as, a, as a starting point. So, so Esther Nawitba uh, was a girl of 15, and she awoke with a start one night. There was a blinding light shining through the windows of the one-room house that she shared with her extended family. Uh, and this is in a highland village near the town of Anarotali. So this is miles from any electric uh, facilities. So, so night was usually pitch black. Nobody had lights, Esther told me years later in the living room of a trusted friend. We were wondering who was outside with that big flashlight. Then men suddenly started banging on the door. They were soldiers. Nobody answered the door, but they kicked it in. You're going to be our new girlfriend, they told me. You're going to come with us to our barracks, post 753. There's the barracks. So the soldiers shot their guns into the air when we protested about them taking me away, Esther continued. One of my uncles said, we could all end up dead here. It's better if you just go with them. Before the missionaries came to uh, the highlands of, of West Papua in the 20th century, uh, poly polygamy was very widely practiced, and uh, a rich man would accumulate many different wives who would toil in the sweet potato gardens. Uh, and then uh, these, these young female kinsmen, their, their daughters, uh, were basically redeemable for a bride price amongst marriage, or upon marriage. Uh, Leslie Butt and Jenny Monroe have writ written extensively about conflicts amongst indigenous sexual mores and the norms of Indonesian civilian settlers. Um, they, they explore the predicament of young West Papuan women who have babies out of wedlock under this omnipresent settler gaze of Indonesian officials. In this instance, e Esther's uncle was making this calculation, this really cynical calculation, that keeping the peace with the Indonesian soldiers was going to be more important than the uh, uh, future prospects of Bragwell. So, so here at this military post, over the course of uh, a year, six different Indonesian soldiers raped Esther. Uh, she later became the exclusive girlfriend, in her words, with the commander of the post. And then she said, she told me, things with the commander weren't that bad. It, it was his subordinates who were rougher. With this newfound status, with this special relationship with the commander, uh, Esther basically began to use this to, to become a, a, a peacemaker. Um, she, she told me, no villagers were ever shot while I was there. When soldiers' tempers would rise, I would steal their guns and hold on to their magazines of bullets. I had to intervene a lot. There were nearly 30 close calls while I was the commander's girlfriend. I might have saved 30 people from getting shot. So I interviewed Esther when she was 25 one year younger than I was at the time, uh, and she insisted that I publish this story with her real name. In committing this story to the public record, Esther was coming to terms with very difficult choices she was forced to make as a young girl. She was overcoming feelings of shame and embracing a sense of indi indi indignation. Um, and, and I think it was that experience in her youth, this experience of braving the soldiers' flaring tempers, that made her brave enough to take this, this defiant public stance as an adult. At the time when I was visiting, bodies were showing up on roadsides, bearing marks of torture. And by telling me the story, and by telling me to use her name, she was risking a similar fate.
So, so during this conversation with Esther, she made it very clear that she did not choose to sleep with the soldier. She also made it very clear that she did not passively resign herself to fate. So it, it was being trapped in this situation of extreme exploitation that she was managing to assert herself in a modest way. She was exceeding the conditions of her exploitation. And in this position, in this position as having this relationship with the commander, she became a, a voice of peace, of human rights, of freedom. So, so Esther's story really forced me to rethink uh, uh, the, the situation of people who are unable to escape these unwanted entanglements and how you can still maneuver for rights and justice within them. Uh, I began to find parallels in her lived experience with the lived experience of West Papuan independence activists who were trapped in the Indonesian military occupation and extreme power asymmetries on the wider global stage. I came to understand that people who are stuck in these subordinate positions have few options other than engaging with the dominant powers that be, building coalitions with agents of power. I found that compromises can open up the field of possibility in seemingly uh, impossible situations. So, so this word collaboration is an ambivalent one, and, and uh, the Nazi occupation of France, you know, the, the collaborators, the French collaborators, uh, uh, basically enabled this occupation, and, and ambivalent memories of, of that moment still haunt Europe. Uh, in West Papua, the word for collaboration is kurjasama, and this, this word is often leveled at, as an accusation at Papuan uh, so-called freedom fighters who are accused of, of selling out to the Indonesian government. Still, I'd like to reclaim collaboration as, as the hopeful edge of political projects. <coughs> the, the question is, why does collaboration work? Um, building on the work of Anna Singh, a cultural anthropologist who also studies out-of-the-way places in Indonesia, I suggest that clever, that clever entanglements can bring, or sorry, clever engagements can bring specific goals within reach, even when all the collaborators do not share the same interests. Risking an alliance with the enemy has the prospect of moving beyond eternal standoffs between opposing interest groups. Uh, coll collaborations create new interests and new identities, writes Anna Singh, but not always to everyone's benefit. Still, these, these seemingly beneficial alliances can qu quickly collapse into relations of raw exploitation. And this is back to that punchline, punchline one. Co collaboration by itself leads to co-optation. So, so trapped in this unwanted entanglement, this unwanted relationship, Esther was able to get piecemeal victories, but ultimately she was trapped, and it was only a miracle that could set her free. So Esther was praying. She was praying to God to deliver her from evil. Um, so even while she was pragmatically engaging with power, making it move in these small molecular ways, she was hoping that there would be some sort of divine intervention that would liberate her. And then one day, she was met with a wonderful surprise. She, she became pregnant. And, and this was unheard of at this post. There was a lot of other women being kept as sexual slaves, but it was rough sex and rampant sexual infections that basically stopped them from getting pregnant. Um, Esther told me none of the other girls being held here had become pregnant before. My baby was a miracle. So, so after she was pregnant, no one wanted to sleep with her. She was able to escape. She went to the Lowlands and had her baby in peace. So, so this story taught me that uh, it's possible to maneuver for rights and justice in these compromised situations while still holding on to hope for a future to come. So now I turn to the part of my talk about imagination. I, I arrived in West Papua in 1998 on the heels of a series of natural and social disasters. There was an El Nino drought that year. There was uh, the Asian financial crisis, massive forest fires, smog clouds, widespread crop failures. There was massive violence. And, and strangely, all these crises were, were a sign of hope. Um, President Soharto had been in the power, in power of, uh, uh, over Indonesia as president for over 32 years. And, and these crises were signs that his regime was starting to come unhinged. So for many years, living under the Soharto dictatorship, it was the homogenous empty time when nothing seemed to happen. All events, all public protests were quickly hidden from public view. Um, but then a, a series of events were happening, and people began to pin their hopes on an on imagined future event, something that seemed impossible, that Soharto would resign. Um, so basically thousands of people got together and started hoping for this seemingly impossible thing in this moment that I think really prefigures the Arab Spring, something that's come more than a decade later, 
all, all these people just, just got together and, and hoped that President Suharto would march out through the gates of the presidential palace, never again to return. So they, they focused their collective energy on this single thing, this event. And in this event, there was a lot of dreams that, that were wrapped up in it. People hoped that corruption would end, that uh, human rights violations would end. A lot of different things were, were pinned on this moment. So then the thing happened, sort of inexplicably. It, it, it was this moment where it could have ended horribly. It could have ended in this massive show of police and military violence once and for all quelling the movement. But instead, they got what they hoped for. So Harto resigned. And, and in, this, in, this, in this moment of, of success, I want to suggest that uh, you know, it, it was also a moment of failure. All, all those things that people had hoped for that would change in a dramatic way, not all of them came true. Um, you know, there were still human rights abuses in, in the aftermath of Soharto's re resignation. There was still corruption, nepotism, poor labor relations, a host of other injustices were to continue. But, but I think the question in those post-revolutionary moments like this, like, like the resignation of Mubarak, like, like uh, say, the election of President Obama, um, you know, all, all these are partial successes, right? And, and the question becomes, does one give up after a particular moment fails to actualize every element of expansive dreams? Or does one appreciate what has changed and maintain an openness to the possibility of future changes? So I arrived in West Papua in the moments, in the weeks, after Soharto had resigned. I had applied for a visa, I worked for two years to try to get a visa, and then miraculously, suddenly, after Soharto resigns, it's granted to me. I'm, I'm an undergraduate exchange student, and uh, uh, I show up as, as history is being made on, on the streets all around me. So, so the, the Indonesian flag here, red and white, is here, replaced with the Morning Star flag, West Papua's banner of independence. Um, so, so basically all around me, this, this revolutionary spirit was on the loose. They, they had taken this, this hopeful moment and transformed their, their dreams onto a different future event. Folks were waiting for, for an independence referendum to be get, given the opportunity to vote on the issue of independence. But I, I wasn't interested in this. I, I was an undergrad. I uh, wanted to do an undergraduate thesis about ethnobiology. West Papua was a great place for those kind of questions. There's over 253 indigenous languages, a lot of endemic species. So I was trying to put blinders on, and I was going to the library every day, reading undergraduate theses. And uh, that, that was sort of my daily routine. Uh, and then one day, someone stopped me and interrupted my daily routine. This guy named Agus, uh, a, a short older man with a deeply creased face who wore a soul patch, the small beard on the lower lip that was once uh, uh, stylish both in metropolitan centers of style in the north and rural parts of West Papua. So, so Agus basically grabbed hold of me, he waylaid me one afternoon and said, I want you to come back here tomorrow and bring a tape recorder. I, I want to tell you some history. So, so when I came back, he began this monologue in thickly a accented Logat Papua, this Creole dialect of Indonesian that's spoken in West Papua. And he told me, on this little tape, I want to record a statement. If you go to the global world body's place of gathering, please pass on this language, he said. So, so we were standing outside the library, and, and passerby were, were looking at this sort of like we're crazy. Uh, he, he says, this, this language is named the rough language, the villager language that I'm talking. You can translate it into refined English if you want to pass it along. So, so August was, was the first of many West Papuan activists who tried to gain my ear. And here I was expecting maybe an encounter with an indigenous culture that would teach me about uh, the opposite to what I knew, maybe myths in contrast to the history that I knew. Maybe instead of a cyclical time, a linear model of time, maybe eminent gods in, in, in contrast to the transcendent Christian god that I knew. But it, instead of these predictable differences, I, I discovered startling and disquieting tales when I tried to listen to what August was telling me. These seemingly familiar stories about global historical figures and institutions were told to me in unfamiliar ways. Uh, as, as August was telling me about his own freedom dreams, trying to use the languages of history, of law, of human rights, I found myself struggling to keep up. So August started talking about US historical figures. He said, Kennedy and his secretaries have sin. He already saw, but he pretended not to know. He already saw, but he played dumb. It didn't matter, just kill them. And I, I was sort of 
befuddled. I, I didn't know what to make of what August was telling me. He, he continued, my, my message is that the United Nations, he has sins. Above the UN is God, below him are governments. Is that the global world body? Is that the UN? Does the UN rule the kingdom of heaven? No, he is just a regular human. So again, I was totally befuddled. I didn't know what to make of this. I, I did know that what, what we were talking about was definitely very, very sensitive. And if uh, the authorities talk, talk, caught us talking like this, we get in trouble. Um, but, but I was also wondering, was, was, was there any truth to the story about the Kennedy family or the United Nations? Or was, was this guy just rambling, perhaps delusional? Let's uh, stick with that picture. So I, I came to learn many years later that there, there was a lot of truth behind what August was trying to tell me. So Robert F. Kennedy, John F. Kennedy's brother, went to The Hague in 1962 in February and helped initiate the, the so-called New York Agreement that later was signed in New York. And let me just read you a bit from this New York Agreement. This is a, a ceasefire between the Netherlands and Indonesia. Basically, the Netherlands were holding on to West Papua as the last outpost in, in their colonial empire and uh, Indonesia invaded, and the Kennedy government intervened. So the ceasefire uh, contained a provision that guaranteed West Papuans' right to participate in, quote, an act of self-determination that would give them the opportunity to decide, A, whether they wish to remain within Indonesia, or B, whether they wish to sever their ties with Indonesia. But there was never a, a referendum that took place according to those rules. So in 1969, <coughs> instead of a one man, one vote referendum, this consultation was staged called the Act of Free Choice. And, and here you have uh, Indonesian pop stars uh, sort of uh, uh, trying to convince indigenous people that Indonesia is a, a really great thing. You have indigenous leaders being handpicked, being given prostitutes, being given beer, and told to vote for Indonesia. And the result was unanimous. All, all of the delegates in this hand-selected event said, we want to be part of Indonesia. And this was during the, the, the days of the Soharto era, when on, on the heels of, of uh, a massacre that killed about a million people in Indonesia who were suspected to be communist. So, so here's the other part of my punchline. So, so back to August and his hopes that one day the historical wrongs will be righted this is the second part of the, the, the punchline. If, if you're just having those hopes and not doing anything about it, that, that leads to paralysis. So, so back to the streets of West Papua in 1998, um, hope and collaboration started to come together. Um, there, there was a letter that I didn't know about that was circulating like wildfire at the time, signed by two members of Congress, Christopher Smith and Patrick Kennedy. Patrick Kennedy is the son of Ted Kennedy, who until recently was the last Kennedy in, in the US government. And this, this letter was addressed to the new president of Indonesia, B.J. Habibi, and was asking Habibi to start looking into the case of, of East Timor and, and West Papua and uh, uh, to, to sort of pay attention to the human rights abuses. And, and, and this letter was taken as evidence by many Papuans that the global world leaders had convened and had decided to suddenly right historical wrongs. So I met August right here in Jayapura, uh, outside the university. A few weeks after he waylaid me at the university, two students were shot. Uh, Stefan Surpati was shot in the head and killed. He was a law student, and a middle school girl was shot and wounded in, in her leg. And I decided I wanted to get out of there. I, I was on canvas, and I, I fled the, the shooting. I was, I was hiding under a table when it was taking place. So on July the 2nd, I got on an ocean liner, a ferry that took me to Biak. And uh, when, when I got to Biak, I was surprised to find Philip Karma leading another flag raising. So Philip Karma was a civil servant in the provincial administration of, of the Indonesian government, and he was also this member of a very prominent Biak family. Years later, he told me, when I read that letter from the members of US Congress, it lit my passion for the struggle on fire. Uh, so so he, he sort of led this, this uh, flag raising by accident. It happened spontaneously, Karma later recalled. We didn't have a planning meeting. So I came to learn that revolutions are unexpected by everyone, sometimes even their organizers. Initially, after uh, Philip Karma ran a Morning Star flag up, up the uh, water tower of the Biak Harbor, there was just a few dozen people who gathered. 
As people saw it, as rumors spread out into the villages, the flag attracted larger and larger crowds. By noon, over a thousand people had, had joined. Philip Carmel was urging the masses to defend the flag only using the Bible and him as their weapons, so only song in this book. He, he told the crowd, Indonesian law states that security personnel or the police can let bullets fly if their life is at risk. If we're only armed with the Bible and songs, the police will not shoot us. So, so Jacques Derrida, this, this French philosopher who is the founder of uh, uh, the, the school of deconstruction, makes a distinction um, between uh, people who look towards the future rather than violent ends. He, he draws a, a, a distinction between apocalyptic hopes and thoughts and messianic thinking. Uh, Derrida says that hopes co con connected to the arrival of a messiah contain the attraction, the invincible elan, or the affirmation of an unpredictable future to, to come, or even a past to come again. Derrida maintains that not only should we not re renounce this desire, but it's necessary to insist upon it more than ever. So, so he's reclaiming the promise of Messianic popes. Derrida is saying, <coughs> expecting the unexpected, expecting that the, that the course of history is going to change suddenly by the arrival of something, is, is what should happen. And, and, it's, and it's separate from hopes that are, are about the end of the world. So, so it's, it's in Philip Karma's mind and in his action that imagination comes together with collaboration, that freedom comes within reach. So, so as this, this crowd was gathering under the flagpole, there wasn't a clear consensus about a single object of desire. This, this revolutionary spirit, this messianic spirit that was animating the crowd was animating a, a lot of different things. So people were hoping for both secular and religious things. So, so some people wanted the UN to show up. They, they heard that there was a, a delegation in Jakarta on its way to East Timor, and they wanted this delegation to also come to West Papua. People were hoping that Kofi Annan, then the Secretary General of the UN, would show up. Uh, there were reports that CNN journalists were going to arrive. Some people said that Jesus was about to come. Uh, you know, other, other people saw that, that the messianic spirit was already working in Philip Karma. There was a fiery light to his eyes that, that drew people in, that, that attracted this crowd. So in this moment, as, as everyone's gathered, imagination met collaboration. So, so Basically, the, there was a local audience to this, right? In contrast to the Indonesian student reformers who were gathering outside of parliament in the thousands, um, they're, they're, the freedom dreams of these student activists were being heard by elite national politicians, by international activists and key world leaders. In contrast, all of Philip Karma's words were only heard by his followers locally and uh, uh, by the security forces stationed nearby. Still, for this assembled crowd, this speech helped bring a seemingly impossible desire, national freedom within reach. So, so when I arrived on this, on this boat, people were hoping that someone was going to show up from the outside, that CNN journalists or the UN was going to arrive and, and see what had been going on and sort of recognize what was happening. Uh, but when I got off the boat, I, I was the only foreigner. There was, there was uh, several thousand people on, on this ferry. Uh, I could quickly see, palpably, these expansive hopes turn quickly to disappointment when they realized that I was just an undergraduate exchange student. So, so in this moment, as, as they're waiting un under the water tower, um, no one knows what's going to happen, right? So it, it could be just like the Indonesian student movement. They could achieve something miraculous, uh, or, or it could end horribly. So it ended horribly. Uh, four years later, I returned to Biak with the intent of piecing together what happened that day on July 6, 1998. Uh, I, I approached the survivors of the incident uh, through El San Papua, a human rights organization that sponsored my research. One of the survivors, a woman who uh, had a church near the harbor, told me about the first moments of the attack. While we were carrying food that morning, we saw several army trucks approaching. She carried food to the protesters every morning. Uh, the, the soldiers in this truck told us all to wait, but when we saw that they were military, we were afraid. 
We began running with the food and the water. They began chasing us with their guns blazing. We screamed, the enemy is here. As the attack started, Philip Karma roused his followers, all unarmed civilians with a hymn. They held hands sitting in a circle under the water tower where the flag still flew. They were mowed down as they continued to sing. Another survivor told me, the, so the soldiers made a kind of letter U. There were brown police and riot gear, there were army troops, a company of soldiers from the local coding barracks, as well as Navy personnel. They all formed a letter U around us and then they shot at us repeatedly. Another eyewitness reported that the Bremont troops who fired the first shots were West Pop ones. He recognized them as local troops stationed in Bia. During the initial shot, the initial assault, Philip Karma was shot twice, once in each leg, but he survived the incident. Many of his followers were not so fortunate and were killed instantly. 29 people were killed in this initial assault, according to Philip Karma in a secondhand report from a low ranking soldier. So the people who survived that initial assault were loaded onto their ships. And I, I was basically holed up in a hotel, and I took this picture of the ships uh, from, from my hotel room. Uh, so of, of those 139 people, there, there was a total of 32 dead bodies that later washed up on shore. Basically, the ships took uh, the survivors of that shooting, held them to the middle of the ocean, and dumped them overboard. The Indonesian government claimed that these corpses were transnational travelers. They said that there was a, a tsunami on uh, uh, Papua New Guinea on July 17th that explained these, these bodies. But this, this explanation does not match the facts. There were four bodies that washed up on the beaches of Biak on July 10th, so that's seven days before the tsunami, and four days after police had been fired on the demonstrators. The bodies of the people who were shot under the water tower were heaped into a small cargo truck. Some of these people were not yet dead. Several eyewitnesses reported that the truck was filled with corpses. It departed from the harbor and then returned for another load. I could count 15 people in the first load, one eyewitness told me. The truck came a second time, and I counted 17 people inside. When they opened up the truck bed, I could see lots of blood. In that small truck, there was lots of blood. So Philip Carman has told me where the mass graves from this incident are, uh, but no forensic archaeologists have, have yet been to visit the site. So going back to that distinction that Derrida draws between the apocalyptic and the messianic, I, I, I want to say in conclusion that this was not an apocalyptic ending. This was not the end of the world for the people of West Papua. Uh, and it was not a definitive break with the past. So this, this use of raw violence to quell the protest became evidence of continuity. So, so this, this was an event shortly after Soharto's re resignation that signaled that the same old tactics were being deployed in this new era of so-called reform. Uh, at the same time, these old tactics weren't working anymore. As Indonesian forces deliberated and tried to destroy the freedom dreams of the West Papuan people with spectacular violence, uh, the movement exploded with activity. In July 1998, West Papuans were evading Indonesian authorities by staging events in multiple places all at once. Even as the protests I witnessed in Jayapura, the students getting shot, and here in Biak were disrupted with this violence, flag raisings were taking place in Sorong, a city in the Bird's Head region of West Papua as well as Wamin and the Highlands were, were Leslie Buckworks. The struggle for, for freedom was spreading underground. It was on the move, evading, detections by, evading detection by authorities. So, so after decades of failed promises, West, West, Papua, West Papuan activists have held on to hope. Um, they've held on to this revolutionary spirit, and they've started to channel it in surprising directions. And it's, it's not just nationalism that these people are hoping for. They're, they're hoping for uh, seemingly improbable things, like reigning in social and economic equity on a global scale. And if, if folks are interested, that's, that's more what I'm going to be talking about tonight. Uh, so, so it was under shrewd leadership from people like Philip Karma, who is now an Amnesty International prisoner of conscience, who's serving a 15-year jail sentence. It was under leadership from people like him that imaginative dreams began to ignite a mass movement that reconfigured relations of power. At the dawn of the early 20th and 21st century, indigenous intellectuals began to pen collective hopes to multiple figures and objects of desire. As these expansive dreams became concrete, 
as specific events appeared on future horizons and particular leaders embodied the messianic spirit, a wildly popular social movement has exploded with activity. Thank you.